This evening as we begin, I want to take a moment to thank once again all of you, but I want to thank in particular His Lordship, Honorable Justice Simeon Cheboso Amati, who earlier today granted me the opportunity to go and visit for he and the justices of River State. And I want to thank him publicly. I know he is watching. He has a downlink center in his very home. And I want to thank him for his kindness today. I also would like to thank Vice Chancellor Professor Lirun Okobule, who is uh, the Vice Chancellor of River State University. I am grateful for the opportunity to have been there today. Thank you for your kindness. And with each day, I feel more and more at home. And I need to tell you, and I, because I'm here, I forget that there are many of you out there that may not know what I'm talking about sometimes, but I felt more Nigerian yesterday than I have felt ever because one of the children came to me when I was leaving, and this child was very distressed, and she took my hand. And she said to me, Pastor, I don't understand something that you're saying. I said, well, tell me what you don't know. And she said to me, I don't know what nyafo nyafo means. <laughs> and so I had the opportunity to teach a Nigerian child about pigeon. For those of you that are watching around the world, you may be wondering when I get excited and I say, nyafo, nyafo, what does this mean? It means that God will bless us plentifully, He will bless us truthfully and verily, and we can depend on it. And so all around the world, if you're in Russia tonight, if you're in Australia, if you're in America, Canada, wherever you are, it's very simple. You just simply say, God will bless you, nyafo, nyafo. So I feel very at home. So thank you. You know, we've been on a journey together and we've been going through the scriptures and trying to understand what God has for us. And yesterday, we saw that, that the world is spiraling, going down. And people are living however they want to live and they have no accountability. But the Bible gives us good news. And it says that there's an end coming because we're almost home. And the Bible promises that Jesus is coming to take us home. And He says this is what's going to help take you home. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. You remember for yesterday, there are two things. The Bible says here is the patience or here is the endurance of the saints how many of you are saints we're all saints if you've given your life to Jesus you are a saint of the Lord God Almighty sometimes you may not act like a saint but you need to confess your sins and ask the Lord to help you to be obedient and to be his saint truly but God said if you want to be ready for the end there are two things to keep the commandments of God And to have the faith of Jesus. To have the faith of Jesus means this. In the last moments of Jesus' life, Jesus knew He was going to die and Jesus prayed. And when Jesus prayed, He prayed to His Father in Heaven and He said, Lord, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from Me. And this is not because Jesus didn't want to die for us. 
It's because Jesus began to experience something he had never experienced before. Because there in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prayed, the sins of the world, and let's turn that into a number, the sins of everyone who had lived for 4,000 years before Jesus came to the earth, and the sins of everyone who would live after Jesus for the next several thousand years, all of those sins together were placed upon the one man, Jesus. Have you ever felt guilty before? Have you ever done something wrong and felt very guilty or ashamed? I want you to imagine the shame and the guilt that you have felt and multiply that times they estimate in the history of the earth, depends on what you read, but around 20 billion people have lived throughout time. All of the 20 billion people, their shame and their guilt was dumped upon one man at one moment. It would kill most of us. But then Jesus prayed something very important. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. To have the faith of Jesus is where you come to Jesus and you say, Jesus, this is what I want. But I know what I want may not be what you want for me. And so, Lord, because of that, I don't want you to give me what I want. I want you to give me what you want. Because God has His best for us. And He knows what's best for us. And no matter what we face in our life, Jesus says, I want you to have life, and I want you to have life more abundantly. If Jesus spoke that in Nigerian pidgin, He would say, I want you to have life, nyafo, nyafo. Are you with me? And so the faith of Jesus is where we're willing to say to the Lord, I'm going to do what you want me to do. I will be happy with what you give me. And I will still praise and worship you no matter what. That is often easier said than done. And then the Bible says, if we want to endure to the end, we need to keep the commandments of God. Tonight and tomorrow, I'm going to share with you history's greatest hoax. And I want to share with you that what the Wahala man has done has actually robbed the African continent and the Nigerian people of a blessing that he gave 6,000 years ago but it has been forgotten. So tonight and tomorrow are of vital importance. I was reading about Nigeria and I've had the opportunity to speak with the doctor 
Have you all been listening to the doctor's presentations each night? They are a blessing, aren't they? I am so thankful that he is here. Sometimes talking to a doctor is difficult because sometimes a doctor tells you things that you don't want to know. But when he tells you something you don't want to know, it's because he desires to help you. And this is how the spiritual life is as well. Because the Bible calls Jesus the great physician. And sometimes Jesus tells us things that are very difficult to hear. But it is for our best interest. And as I was reading about Nigeria, over the course of the last 40 years, there has been an extraordinary rise in hypertension, which is stress. There's been an extraordinary rise in sedentary lifestyle, meaning that we, we sit down a lot. There has been an expansion, uh, an ex- excuse me, an explosion of diabetes, and it has caused a rising epidemic in Nigeria. So much so that in 2015, Bloomberg did a study, and it studied all the nations of the world. And Nigeria was found to be the most stressful country in the world to live in. And for many of you, this is not surprising. Because you're living under stress. The stress of maybe not being employed. I've prayed with a number of you about jobs. You're qualified. You have the certificates, but you have no job. I've prayed with many of you who have come to me and said, I'm hungry. Our family doesn't know where our next meal will come from. Today, our our team went and prayed with a man by the name of James. James from Ubi Mini. I hope I've said that's right. A village where James made a decision that he would no longer worship the gods and Wahala man. And today he made a decision to tear down an altar and burn it. And you're not going to want to miss because he will be here to be baptized this weekend. I know that there are many watching at Downlink Centers. Maybe there are some here that are living in a life of stress because you are haunted by the demonic forces of hell. Some of you are stressed because you've made choices. Maybe it's drugs or alcohol and you just don't know how you're going to get out. God gave an answer to our stressful world many thousands of years ago. The retired Brigadier General Benga Okolate, a psychiatrist at the Nigerian military hospital in Yaba, has identified stress as the major cause of mental and physical illness in the country. In fact, he identified that 80% of the suicides that are happening in Nigeria are a direct result of stress. God provided a solution to stress. He provided a solution to anxiety. He provided a solution to worry over 6,000 years ago. But unfortunately, man stopped listening and some men stole the blessing for those who had that blessing. And tonight and tomorrow, I'm going to share with you how you can regain that blessing that God has in store. In the last day message of the book of Revelation, God calls us to find rest. Do you need rest? Are you tired? 
tired in many ways. God calls us to a time of rest. In Revelation, the 14th chapter, often referred to as the three angels' messages of Revelation, we find the key issue in the last days in which we are living. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7, it says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And we studied that just a few days ago, right? We are living in the judgment hour. Since 1844, we have been living in God's judgment hour. It's a time to get serious and prepared for Jesus' coming is now. It's not tomorrow. It's not next week. It's now. But then it goes on and it says this, it shares with us the key issue in the entire book of Revelation. And it says, and worship him who made. You have continued the verse. The key issue in the book of Revelation is not a fiery dragon, it's not a beast. It's not seven candlesticks, it's not seven trumpets, it's not seven seals, it's not uh, uh, the harlot woman, that's not the key issue. The key issue is one thing, and that is worship. The book of Revelation can be summarized with this simple statement, who, excuse me, simple question, who will you worship? Will you worship God, the one that blesses Nyafo Nyafo, or will we worship God? The Wahala man who has Wahala for you. Wahala no good. This is the key issue. But the book of Revelation calls us to worship the one who made. The one who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Which is a nice way of saying the one who made everything. You see, when we understand God as creator, it is a very powerful concept. Because it leads us back to the one who made us. And it gives us security and rest in his love and in his care. So that no matter what I face, if I've run out of rice, I know the one who made the rice. If I run out of gari, I know the one who made the gari. If I've run out of beans, I know the one who made the beans. If I've run out of bitter leaf, I know the one who made the bitter leaf. And it allows me to trust in him and believe that he will sustain me no matter what I face. But unfortunately, much of the world has forgot about the creator. How do we worship the creator of the heavens and the earth and find the rest and security that he offers? It says, worship him who made the heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. If you are a student of the Bible, that sentence should sound familiar to you. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When the Apostle John was writing from that island of Patmos, he was thinking about and looking back to the very beginning. And so let's go back to the beginning and see if we might find the secret or the blessing that God has in store for you and for all of you and for me. A blessing that was stolen by the Wahala man. What was that blessing? There in the book of Genesis, we have all the creation. 
the creation story where the Bible says God spoke and it was done. God spoke and it stood fast. So there God, He made the earth. He made the waters on the earth. He made the sky above the earth. He made the sun. He made the moon. He made the stars. He made the animals. He made the vegetation. Which means, by the way, if God made the vegetation, this means that God made cassava. Which, I can't prove it, but maybe God taught Adam and Eve how to make fufu in the Garden of Eden. I can't prove it. But God is the one that created cassava. To my friends in Ghana, I know your fufu has cassava and yam or cassava and plantain. He made it all. I know here in Nigeria we don't do this. We don't mix. At least that's how it's been explained to me. But then in the Garden of Eden, God did something very special. He made humanity. First he made the man. And then out of the man, he made the woman. And after he made man in his image, and he created male and female, and there was perfect peace and serenity in the Garden of Eden, the Bible says that God did something else. He had created all these things, And then the Bible says that God created something. In Genesis chapter 2, after six days of creating, the Bible says that God on the seventh day ended His work, which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. And then He did something very interesting. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it He rested from all His work which He had created and made. So God made everything and then God made a special day which the Bible says He blessed. What? Does it mean that He blessed it? By the way, and the Sabbath was to always remind us that God created everything and most importantly to remind me that He created me. What does it mean that God blessed the Sabbath day? Well, when He blessed the Sabbath day, it was a sign of that He was the Creator, but also the sign that He loves us forever. It was blessed that we might know Him and that He is the one that blesses us. But it also says that He he sanctified it. And He rested on it. To sanctify means to set it aside for a holy purpose. So God made the earth, the sky, the sea, the sun, the moon, the stars, the animals, the vegetation. He made humanity and then He made a day which was a gift and a blessing to humanity. But that blessing and gift seems to be something that was stolen. It's very interesting if you start reading about the seven-day week. You begin to find out some interesting thing, and I should invite the doctor to come and talk to you about this, but there are books that talk about 
how the human body is designed to operate on a seven-day cycle. If you need a liver transplant, there are certain days on which it is better to transplant that liver because the body operates on a seven-day cycle. When your immune system responds to disease, it operates on a seven-day cycle. All kinds of operations in the human body, and by the way, out in nature, operate on a seven-day cycle. And that might lead one to ask the question, well, why is that? How long does it take the moon to go around the earth? It's not a trick question. How long? 30 days, which is how long a month is, which is why it's called a month. It's a moon. Oh, somebody said, oh, okay. I see we taught, we learned something. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you learned something, my brother. This is good. How long does it take the earth to go around the sun? It's not a trick question. I always will warn you if it's a trick question. 365 days. This is a year, right? Yes. What body in the heavens operates on a seven-day cycle? That's a trick question. There's nothing. There is only one basis on which we have a seven-day week. And that is the Holy Scriptures in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. That's it. The amazing thing about that is God promises in Deuteronomy chapter 5, you shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land in which you shall possess. Which says if you're obedient, you're going to live long. Being obedient, including to keep God's holy Sabbath day holy. But it's interesting in history, just a month ago I was in France. And in the 1700s there was the French Revolution. And in the Revolution, they entered into the churches and they destroyed many churches and they killed many Christians. But in the big cathedral in Paris, Notre Dame, they came and they tore down the cross and they brought in the goddess of reason. And they wanted to eradicate society of any knowledge of God because they blamed God for what was happening. And what is it that they did? They tried to change the weekly cycle. They tried to become a more efficient nation and they tried to go to a 10-day week. Could you imagine a 10-day week? Could you imagine working for nine days in a row? A 10-day week. And the society collapsed under the stress that a 10-day week put upon the people. Well, then a little later in history, Stalin didn't learn from the history of France, and he instituted the same. And after 11 years, because some people will say, oh, if I work more days, my production will go up. But what happened in Russia? The production went down. People became irresponsible and immoral. And after an 11-year experiment where they tried to change the weekly cycle, they went back to a seven-day week. Why would have Russia tried to eliminate the seven-day week? Because the seven-day week recognizes that there is a creator God, and the Russian society wanted to build an atheistic, communist society. And tonight I'm here to share with you that many have been robbed of the blessing of the Sabbath day rest, because in Daniel chapter 7, it speaks of a religious power and that religious power sponsored many missionaries around the world, including Africa. And that power sought to change times and law. God's law in particular. 
and they begin to proclaim that doctrine throughout all the world that this lie was accepted by many cultures and in so doing robbed many cultures and societies of the blessing that God had given in the very Garden of Eden. The book of Revelation says that this same power desires that it would be worshipped and it blasphemed God. Blasphemy is making yourself to be God. They made themselves to be God because they changed or attempted to change God's very law. God intended from the very origin of time that there would be one day every week and not just any day but the seventh day of the week that would be the day that God had set aside for man to commune with Him and understand Him as Creator and understand Him as Redeemer. But the Bible says in Revelation 12 that the dragon, the Wahala man, has made war on those who keep the commandments of God. Because the commandments of God, which we studied yesterday, Right in the very middle of the Ten Commandments of God is a call to remember the Sabbath day. And that call to remember angers the Wahala man because it points us to worship God alone and to discard the deception of the Wahala man. God is calling upon a people who keep His commandments because His commandments were written to endure forever. And yesterday we talked about the Ten Commandments written in stone. But the Bible promises that God wants to write His Ten Commandments someplace else. He wants to write those Ten Commandments on your heart. Hebrews chapter 8 says this, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Have you allowed God to write His law in your heart? Have you allowed God to write His law in your mind? Because He wants you to worship Him because He loves you. There at the very center of the Ten Commandments, which God wants to write in our heart and in our mind, it says, remember. Now, I want to ask you a question. I don't know how it is in Nigeria, but... Back in the United States, sometimes I will go to the market for my wife. Husbands, do you go to the market for your wife sometimes? I will be available for marriage counseling later. It is of great debate whether husbands go to the market for their wives. Without understanding Nigerian culture, I go to the market for my wife. And it sounds like from the murmuring of the women that husbands, it may be well for you to go to the market for your wife. But when I go to the market for my wife, sometimes she says, remember, remember this, remember that. Why does my wife say, remember? Because she knows that I will forget. Praise God for phones 
or pens and pencils where you can write a note that it helps you to remember. And by the way, this is like God. Why he wants to write it on your heart and write it in your mind is it's very easy to forget. And so God says to his people, remember. Because he knew that there would be a day in which we would forget. And he says, remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. He said, remember, because people would forget. And then he gives instructions. Six days. How many days? Six days. You should do your labor and how much of your work? All of your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, and in it you shall do no work. In the original Hebrew, when you read the fourth commandment, it literally says, for six days you will do, but on the seventh day you will stop doing. Why is that? Because for six days we work. But on the seventh day, God works. He works to change your heart, to change your mind, and to help you reconnect with Him. Because if we don't have time that is focused on reconnecting with God, it's easy to forget. Every day when I go to my hotel, I clean up and do a few things, but every day I do something. You know what that is? Oh, you see, you're smiling. You know, brother. I call my wife every day because when I call my wife, it helps her to know that I didn't forget. And while I love you in Nigeria, I love my wife and I will not forget. God has given us the Sabbath so that we won't forget. The Bible says that the seventh day is the Sabbath. There are many Bible teachers and preachers today all around the world that will tell you it doesn't matter what day, just let it be one day. There are several illustrations that I could use, but I was reading And I want to share with you an an old African story. There was a man. Now the story is ten sons, but for my story I will make it seven sons. This African man had seven sons. And he spoke to the governor of his house. He says, I am going to leave on a journey. I want you to take care of my home and take care of my sons. And the governor of the home said, yes, sir. And the master of the home left. And on the first day, he lined up the seven sons. And one by one, he says, I want you to go do this. I want you to go do that. I want you to go do this. I want you to go do that. I want you to do this. But then he came to the seventh son. You don't look like a son of the master. I want you to go work with the slaves. And then the master of, excuse me, The governor of the home took one of his sons and put his son in place of the seventh son. And this went on for some time. 
And then the master of the home returned. He says, please, line up my sons. I want to greet them. And these seven sons, six sons, were lined up with the seventh being an imposter. And the master of the home went one by one, blessing his sons, blessing his sons, blessing his sons. And then he came to the seventh and he looked at him and he said, you, you, you are not my son. And he looked at the governor of the home and he said, where is my son? And the governor of the home said, sir, your seventh son didn't look like he was your son. So I made my son to be your son. To which the master of the home says, find my son and bring him back because that is my son. And the African proverb speaks of the governor of the home and all of his sons being cast out of the house. You see, God has not just given us one day in seven. He has given us the seventh day. And we are to be obedient. To the women. If you just went home tonight with any man, this would not be good. Because you are married to one man. To the men, if you went home tonight with any woman, because the Bible says that it's not good for man to be alone, and I will just choose one of any women, this will not be good. God blessed and sanctified the seventh day. And in that day, there is a blessing. The commandment says, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Not one day in seven, but the seventh day. Worship Him who made the heavens and the earth. It is a call to worship the Creator. The origin of the Sabbath is God Himself. It is God's gift to you. Some people will say to me though, Pastor, what you're talking about, that's just for the Jews. That's not for Christians. Were Adam and Eve Jews? There were no Jews yet. In fact, the Bible says that the Sabbath was made for man. The word man is the Greek word anthropos, from which we get our English word anthropology, which if that's all very complicated, that means God made the Sabbath for all of humanity. Which means when God created the Sabbath... He had in his mind that one day there would be a country called Nigeria and the Sabbath would be for Nigeria. In fact, we have evidence of the early people groups all around Africa keeping the seventh day Sabbath as holy. If you're wondering how that blessing was removed from the continent of Africa. You don't want to miss tomorrow night. So you're watching at a downlink center. You don't want to miss tomorrow. Because I'm going to identify how this blessing was robbed from the continent of Africa. Ezekiel chapter 20 says, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them. And then it says something. We often stop the verse there. But then it says that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. 
Listen to this. Don't miss this. Who sanctifies you? God. By the way, some of you might be saying, sanctification, that's a big word. I don't know what that means. Sanctification means that God is preparing you for heaven. That's all it means. And I want you to listen now very carefully. God is the one who sanctifies on the day that he sanctified. Are you following me? And so if we want to experience the full sanctifying power of God, we must recognize the day that he sanctified. And friends, I have news for you. You can read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And you will find that God's faithful people have never worshipped on a different day. There in the Garden of Eden, God gave to Adam and Eve the Sabbath. On Mount Sinai to Moses, He gave the Sabbath. Jesus worshipped on the Sabbath. Paul worshipped on the Sabbath. And for many ages of history, the early Christian church worshipped on the seventh day Sabbath. And as I have already said, for many ages, all across the continent of Africa, there were peoples who worshipped on the seventh day. The Bible says that as the custom was for Jesus, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Luke chapter 4. Don't miss this now, because some people at this point, and if you're watching at a downlink center, while I am speaking in a very strong way, I need to tell you, the reason for that is, is while I'm 49 years old, for 21 years of my life, this blessing that I'm speaking about today, I didn't have that in my life. And see, the Sabbath is important because it tells us that we worship God exclusively and that we love Him supremely because while the world says, no, 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 the seventh day Sabbath, no, 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 no. No, we say we will worship the Bible no matter what it says. We rest in the completed creation of God and we rest in the work that God did on Calvary to redeem us. Jesus said this simple phrase, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus? He loves you. He loves you more than you even know. Deuteronomy 5. When Moses wrote out the Ten Commandments again, it says, And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord God brought you out from Egypt. There by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm, therefore the Lord God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. See, the Sabbath is a reminder that God is the one who breaks the bondage of sin. God is the one who sets you free from whatever it is in your life that's holding you down. The Sabbath is a day of rest. I can worry about many things, but when it comes to Sabbath, I don't have to worry about those things anymore because I know that God will take care of me. The Sabbath is a reminder every single week that God created us and Jesus Christ died for us. Some people will say to me, Pastor, the Sabbath was done away at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, we don't, we don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. People will tell me that when Jesus died on the cross, the commandments were nailed to the cross. But the interesting thing is, is that people, when they tell me that, there's only really one commandment that they have a problem with, and that's the fourth commandment. But if Jesus were going to nail the commandments to the cross, he didn't know that. Because in Matthew 24, and you'll remember when we were studying that Jesus gave the signs of the end of time, 
He, he predicted when Jerusalem would be destroyed, and then he predicted what would happen right before he comes. And in Matthew 24, 20, Jesus said this, and pray that your flight might not be in winter. Okay? And here in Nigeria, you know, winter is not as cold as where I'm from. When, when I come, when I get home, there will be times where the rain, when it falls... <laughs> It's not going to be water. It will be frozen. It will be snow that comes down. And Jesus says, pray that your flight's not in winter because when it's cold, it will be difficult. But then he says, pray that it would not be on the Sabbath because the Sabbath is a day of rest. Jesus, looking into the future to 70 AD, had no idea that the Sabbath would be changed. And the reason he had no idea is because it wasn't changed. Jesus looking down the portals of time, looking to 2023, just before Jesus is going to take us home, he said, pray that your flight's not on the Sabbath. Because Jesus knew. Because he himself said, do not think that I came to change the most holy law of God. Because the Bible says that God's perfect. And it will never be changed. You see, from Adam and Eve to Moses, there was no change of Sabbath. During the time of Jesus, there was no change in Sabbath. And during the time of the Apostle Paul, there was no change in Sabbath. But I have news for you. Even when Jesus died, he kept the Sabbath. The Bible records in Luke chapter 23... Speaking of the day in which Jesus died, that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And so the woman had come with him from Galilee, followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. So they wanted to embalm the body of Jesus and properly wrap his body. But it was Sabbath, so they could, they prepared so that they could do it after the Sabbath. The Bible says they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. And then it says, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices they had prepared. So I want you to take note that when Jesus died, when he was crucified, That was the preparation day. And then Jesus stayed in the grave on the Sabbath day. And then the Bible says on the first day, he rose from the dead. Now I grew up in a faith tradition that easily identifies the day in which Jesus rose from the dead. The first day of the week. Commonly around the world, this is celebrated as Easter, and it always follows on one on a certain day. What day is that? Sunday. So if Sunday is the first day of the week, that means what day is the seventh day of the week? Saturday, or what we would call simply Sabbath, and the preparation day would be Friday. So you have the day that Jesus died, the preparation day, which is Friday, Then Jesus, even in his death, rested on the Sabbath day, which is Saturday. And then he rose from the dead on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday. There are eight texts in the Bible that talk about the first day of the week, and not one of them tells us that we should worship on that day. Not one. But the Bible is filled with texts that tell us that we should worship on the seventh day of the week. In fact, God has given us the symbol of the resurrection. Romans chapter 6 tells us that the symbol of resurrection is when we baptize. We baptize into his death and we are raised to life when we come out of the water. I'll talk about that more on Monday. Don't miss Monday either. You'll regret missing Monday. You see, when we're baptized, we celebrate the resurrection. In 140 languages around the world, The word for Saturday is the word Sabbath. Spanish, sabado. Portuguese, sabado. Italian, sabato. 
so on and so forth. My dear friends, God is calling us. Time has never been lost. From the very creation, the seven-week cycle, seven-day cycle has never been broken. Throughout time, God has blessed His people who were willing to follow Him no matter what the cost. And today, God is calling upon you saying, here is the patience or the endurance of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. We do not obey and keep the Sabbath for God to love us. God already loves us. And He asks us, if you love me, keep my commandments. How many of those commandments? All of the commandments. Not nine of them, not eight of them, not five of them, not four of them, but all of the commandments. And by the way, the Bible says that when Jesus takes us home, we will keep the Sabbath. Isaiah 66 says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh. How much flesh? All flesh. Just won't be one church that's worshiping on Sabbath. Everyone will worship on the Sabbath day. You see, the Sabbath day is a day that God has given for all of humanity. It is a special blessing that He has given for here in Nigeria. He gave it in creation. He gave it again at Mount Sinai. It has been kept by His people. It was kept by Jesus. It was kept by the disciples. It was kept by the Apostle Paul. It is a sign of God's power. It is going to be kept in the new earth. It is a weekly reminder that God is creator and that he wants to bless you, nyafo, nyafo. And that he is redeeming you that you would live life and live it, nafo nafo. And so, my dear friends, tonight Jesus is pleading with us. And I'm going to invite you to stand as the praise team is going to come and they're going to sing. And let's stand together. And I'm going to pray. And I'm running out of time. So I need you to not hesitate tonight. There are many of you that have wanted to pray with me because you're hungry. You don't know where your next meal is coming from. And I want you to come forward because I want to pray a special blessing on you if you don't, if you're not sure where your food's coming from. There are many of you that have asked me to pray for you because you don't have a job and you are looking for the Lord to give you a job. I want you to come. There are some of you. By the way, those of you that are at our downlink centers, I'm going to invite you to, you come. You stand up, you come. There are some of you that you need God's protection in your life because you are facing tremendous stresses and difficulties. I'm going to invite you to come right now. There are some of you here. There are some Bible friends. You've been studying the Bible. Maybe tonight's the first time you've ever heard about the Sabbath. Tonight you want to say, you know what? I'm going to give it all to Jesus. I want to worship God the way he has asked. And I want to keep his Sabbath holy. And if that's you, I want you to come forward. And maybe there's somebody here that you've seen some of these people that were baptized and you're saying, I want the new life that Jesus offers and I want to be baptized. I'm going to invite you to come. I want you to come forward right now. Don't wait for Jesus to keep appealing to you. He loves you. Just come. You come right now. If you're at a downlink center, you come to the front. You speak to your coordinator and you say, today I want to take a stand for Jesus. This blessing was intended for all of us. And the Sabbath is teaching us. He's going to take care of you no matter what you're facing. I don't know when he'll get you a job. 
I don't know how he'll provide for you, but I know the Bible says he will provide. And I want to pray for all of you because I want you to know that as they're singing, someone's praying for you. I got news for you, my dear brother. Not just anybody praying for you. Jesus is praying for you. And Jesus is praying for you. He knows you by name. And even if I don't know your name, Jesus knows your name. And for those of you, wherever you're at home, Jesus knows your name. And he's praying for you. And he's going to transform your life. So, I want you to draw near to me now. Draw near. And we're going to pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, there are a a group of people that have come forward here with a variety of needs. And right now, I want to pray a blessing upon them, Lord. There are some that are hungry. There are some here that have not eaten in days, Lord. And I pray that you would provide a meal for them. There are others that are unemployed. They don't have a job. And I'm going to pray, Lord, a blessing upon them that you would bring good employment into their life. And I pray, dear God, for those that have come forward saying, Lord, I've lived a life of disobedience, and tonight I want to be obedient. I pray, Lord, your nyafo nyafo blessings in their life. And Father in heaven, I pray for those in the downlink centers, for those that are here that have made a decision to be baptized. Please, dear God, transform their life with blessings that are abundant. And may they live for you no matter what the cost. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.